please remain standing for our first hymn this morning on page 73, O Worship the King, page 73. Affirmation of faith this morning is a responsive reading for Thanksgiving found in your bulletin. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. God blesses us with gifts of love. With food and clothing, all in the family. God blesses us with daily work. God protects us in times of danger. And guards us from every evil. God gives us mercy and refuge. He is my strength and salvation. Therefore, we shall offer thanks and praise to the Lord our God. O Lord our God, we give thanks to you forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Zion United Methodist Church. Thanks to everyone joining us here in person and those of you joining us virtually as well. Welcome this morning. Let me, do we have any first time guests with us this morning? If so, please raise your hand. Let's see. I don't think I saw any first timers. We do have one all the way from Idaho. Good to see Aunt Robin with us this morning. <laughs> Let me direct your attention to the flowers. The flowers are to the glory of God and in memory of John and Annie Mae Scoggins, placed with love from Debbie and Eddie Klein. Thank you very much for the flowers this morning. There are some announcements listed on page six, but we'll take those if anyone wants to announce them out loud as well. Uh, Saturday, feel free to come decorate. There'll be a decorating crew here, nine o'clock. 
9 o'clock on this, this coming Saturday to decorate the sanctuary. Please come out for that, the 26th. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's the angel tree is set up back in the narthex, so please be sure to visit that on your way out. Next Sunday, you saw the picture of that. That tree's here at Mount Zion, starting Sunday morning, even though it's just a handful of choir ladies are uh, all still teaching away. It's Sunday night at 6 o'clock in Fellowship Hall uh, is the Mishra Christmas program. 6 o'clock is the Shepherd Gibbs, and so we start out at 6.45. I hope everybody will come, and that's a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of great Christmas music. Some of it you've heard, but Six o'clock next Sunday evening for the uh, Christmas program, so please come out for that. Any other announcements? How about praises or prayer concerns? See? John Fisk and Johnny Fisk. Oh, Johnny has COVID. We'll put him on there. Yes, ma'am. Matt? Olivia and Miss Chester and their families. Mita. Theta Anthony and Dorothy Williams was the last. Fitz, yes, ma'am. Debbie Harbin. Marsha. Yes, ma'am. We'll put Steve Lamb on there. Yes, ma'am. Monica Bittrick. Yeah, yeah. Big time in the life of college students right now. A lot going on. Yes, ma'am. Any others? If there are no more, we'll take these to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Patient God, we seem to think that being people of faith is a campaign for your favor. We posture and we make gestures of holiness and grace, but then we easily slide back into habits of self-centeredness. Yet you have forgiven us each time, calling us beloved children. Today, we are about to complete the journey of this Christian year, during which we have learned of the witness of Jesus Christ, the birth and the growth of the church, and the great lessons of the Hebrew scriptures. This year has been an opportunity for us to renew our acquaintance with all of those who have gone before, who have been faithful disciples. Help us to take these lessons into our hearts and our lives. Let the reign of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, our Savior and King, be evident in all that we say, we think, and do. Give us the confidence and courage 
to truly be your witnesses all the rest of our days. Be with those who we have lifted up this morning. Wrap your healing arms around them. Give them your comfort and your peace, O oh God. We pray these things in confidence in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We'll continue our singing on page 131. We gather together, page 131. Please stand. I invite our ushers to come forward at this time for our offering. And I know we are uh, in a thankful mood this morning. <laughs> we are getting ready to eat a whole bunch of, of all kinds of good stuff this week, aren't we? Uh, I know some folks are, are in town, some folks are coming to town, and uh, I'm praying for safe travels for all who are traveling to, to be with us this week. My mom's coming into town, I'm excited about that. Uh, but I'm grateful, first and foremost, for the Church of Jesus Christ, and especially this church, Mount Zion. I'm thankful for each of you, uh, and I know that uh, the, the feeling might be mutual for the people who are in this building, that you are grateful for the people that are in this building that make up this church. And uh, I'm grateful for the work that we do and the, and the tithes and the offerings that go to support the very important work and mission of God in Southwest Atlanta. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds to give back to God what is already God's, our, our, our offerings and his tithes, let us pray. Almighty creator God, 
we humbly bring our gifts to you this day. On Calvary's cross, your son redefined for the world what it meant to rule, what it meant to be a king. In his life, teaching and interacting with people, Jesus redefined what it means to give in a way that pleases God. May we in this season live and give in a way that reflects that reign over us and the one who lives within us. In the exalted name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 11 through 20. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. At this time, we'd like for the children to come down for the children's message. What holiday are we going to celebrate this week? Not Christmas yet, but it's almost here. It is Thanksgiving. That's right. It's thanks. Yes. And we're out of school this week. Yay. I'm thankful for that. Okay. So 
Does anyone know the story about Thanksgiving? You do? You do about the Indians? Okay, so that is right. So we know that there were English men and women that came over on, what was the name of the ship? Do you know the sh- name? The Mayflower, that's right. And it landed at Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock. And we, it's this in the state of Massachusetts. Okay? And the Indian people that were there helped the settlers and they taught them how to plant corn. Do you like corn? Yes, me too. And so they taught them how to plant corn, and they taught them how to fish and to hunt. And so in 1621, that was a really, really long, long time ago, the pilgrims and the Indians celebrated together the harvest that they had been able to grow. And then President Lincoln, a long time ago in 1863, made Thanksgiving a holiday. Now, do you have any uh, traditions that you do at your house on Thanksgiving? Eat food, eat food. What about watch football? Go outside and play football? Go outside and play? Yes, and and eat food again, right? There you go, that's right. So I want to tell you about a tradition that I want you to do this year. So look, in this little bag are five pieces of candy corn. I love candy corn. You do? Some people don't like it, but I really do like it. Okay, so there are five pieces of candy corn in here to remind you of the corn that the settlers were able to grow. Don't eat it yet. On Thursday, when you sit down with your family and your friends and have Thanksgiving, I want you to get your little bag of your five candy corn. And I want you to tell five things that you are thankful for, okay? One for each piece of candy corn. Can you tell me some right now? Can you, I bet we can think of more than five. Can you think of something that you're thankful for? Tell me. Family, mom and dad. What else? Grandma. Granddaddy, who'd you say? Granddaddy. Okay, we got a lot of family. What about food, your dog, water, food, pets, friends, your home? What? Oh, thank you. (laughs) Teachers for sure. What about, where are we right now? At church. Aren't you thankful we have church? Yes. And God and that Jesus came to save us. We are always, always, always thankful for that, okay? So everybody remember what you're supposed to do? Okay, and I'm going to give you two bags because one has some candy you can eat once you get home, and then one has the candy corn that you're not going to eat till Thursday, okay? Okay, so we're going to say a prayer. You ready? Dear Lord, thank you so much for everything that you have given us. We are truly thankful. We love you. We love these children. Thank you so much for the blessings that you have given us and that we can extend to others. Be with us this week and let us never forget the true part of what we are thankful for, and that is your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, take it. Thanks, Carol. This time we ask you to stand up, greet your neighbor, tell them happy Thanksgiving. God loves you. <laughs> so Lizzie, after this, after we sing, then just go out this door.
If you'll rise in body or in spirit for our gospel reading for today, it comes to us from Luke chapter 22, verses 33 through 43. If you'll rise in body or in spirit. Hear the word of the Lord. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals 
one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of con condemnation? Condemnation. And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. Don't mind that. <laughs> and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and name him Lord of all. That's one of my favorite hymns. I love that hymn. Uh, and it's a really great Christ the King Sunday hymn, and it's a really great Palm Sunday hymn. When Jesus enters into Jerusalem, coming in on a donkey, where people lay down the palm trees and branches and hail him king. That hymn sounds a lot like our Colossians reading for today. But it sounds a lot more triumphant, a lot more powerful than the picture of Jesus Christ crucified that we get in our gospel passage for today. Uh, that's the triumphal en entry. The picture of Jesus Christ crucified is grotesque. This is from the Isenheim altarpiece. It's one of the most grotesque pictures of Jesus that I can think of. The hands is what gets me. But that picture is grotesque that we hear today, not because of what we read in Luke. If you notice that Luke doesn't spend much time on the gory details of the crucifixion. But because of what we bring to the text ourselves, Luke doesn't spend any time describing it. But we, if you've seen the passion of the Christ, once was enough for me, by the way. But we know the gory details. So did Luke's audience. Luke was writing to a bunch of people who knew what crucifixion was. They'd seen it every day. Well, maybe not every day, but a lot of days. Luke wrote to an audience that was well aware of its horrors, much like we are now. But the picture we get from Jesus that we hear about Jesus, of Jesus, that we hear in our gospel passage for today is not of the transformed, glowing Jesus, the transfigured Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. By the way, this is the picture that I get of, of the resplendent Jesus glowing. Uh, if you've seen The Matrix, then this might be the metaphor for you. But indeed, we see the very human, very much in pain, Jesus, surrounded by criminals, put to death by the ones who had the power that Satan had used to tempt him. Luke is less concerned about the bloody mess because he has other things to show us about what Jesus is doing on the cross. Luke has other things for his readers to know, and that is this, that this was indeed Jesus' last temptation. 
that Jesus' submission to the dehumanizing, depersonalizing, violent end of his mortal life was the final resistance to temptation that he first faced in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan. Save yourself, Satan says three times in Luke chapter 4. He doesn't say it directly, but he says, save yourself three times. First, through the use of bread, right? Turning the, the stones to bread it, so, so that Jesus can save himself by getting something to eat when he hasn't eaten for 40 days. Second, with the power of governmental authority. And finally, through the manipulation of divine power. Save yourself, Jesus. Save yourself, Jesus, say the people, the leaders of the people, as he hangs there on the cross. Save yourself, Jesus, say the Roman uh, soldiers who are around him. Save yourself, Jesus, says the thief hanging next to him on the cross. The only way for Jesus to show his true power according to society and Satan the tempter himself is by submitting to the normal way that we all use power every day in this world. To the way that we see our leaders use power. And we know that power very well when we look at the world and we see what the world uses its power for, to harm, to control, to manipulate, to coerce, to impose the people gathered around Jesus say, perform in the ways of the world that you all know. Perform, sing us a song. You're the piano man. Play Freebird. Come down from the cross, Jesus. Save yourself through the violence of this world. And if you don't think that there's violence that would happen if Jesus did come down from that cross, you are wrong. Do you think the Roman uh, soldiers are going to let him walk away from that cross? He'd have to lead the rebellion right then and there. Save yourself means use power in the same old ways that we always see and that we always hear about. And instead, Jesus shows us a, an alternative way to go about using our power. It's a way that ends, or so we suppose, in his death. But we know the whole story. We know that death is not the last word of his way. It's a way of using power that is contrary to everything that this world shows us, but very much in line with how Jesus always used his power throughout the Gospel of Luke. Jesus' power was not in how he came to sit with the powerful and the rich and the religious elites to scratch their itching ears to teach the same old things that they had always taught, to heal the head colds of the religious elite. Jesus came to preach good news to the poor, liberation to the prisoner, he healing of sight to the blind, and jubilee he used his power to bring those on the margins into the center and into the very spotlight of the synagogue of society and he used his power to speak truth to power in ways that ended up getting him killed he used his power to uh, to bring about a change in the way that we understand our own power and our own authority that should have, should have changed the way that we operate in this world right now, and we don't. We haven't changed. It should have showed us that servant leadership is the way that we are to exercise our power in this world. Service to all. Service to those who are unlike us. Service to the ones who drive us crazy. Service to those who need God's grace just like you and I do. 
service to all. Colossians says, if you remember that from our text, that Jesus used his power to reconcile all things, all things through his death on the cross. And instead of reconciling all things, we've not listened, whether as a church or as society or as individuals, we've sought our own preservation, our own power, our own priority over and above others. We've fallen short of the radical way that Jesus lived utterly for others. Even on the cross, Jesus resisted the dehumanization of execution and continued to be who he really was. Somebody who knew our need, the very human need for divine grace, and who dealt it out extravagantly. You can hear it in the words of his prayer. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. One of the last things he said before he died was on behalf of those who were standing there mocking him and executing them, using power in the same old ways that we've always seen. Using power for death. And that's also my prayer for us in this world sometimes. Forgive us. Forgive us because we don't know what we're doing. We don't know what we're doing when we're using our power in harmful and hurtful ways. We sometimes aren't even aware of the consequences of our own use of power. And Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus doesn't, doesn't just say a prayer for the authorities who are using their power to crucify God's very own unique son, but also to extend grace to the thief who asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom, to forget the reason, the very reason why he was there in the first place, to remember the good in his life and not the bad, to remember that he was indeed a person in need of grace. And so Jesus, full of grace, even as he dies on the cross, is actively dying on the cross, full of grace, extends grace one more time. Saying today he would be with Jesus in paradise. One last time, Jesus gives grace to someone who doesn't deserve it. At least in the eyes of our world, right? I think we assume that if someone's dying on the cross, they're there for a reason. We assume incorrectly sometimes, don't we? We see Jesus hanging on the cross and know he was there for no good reason. Jesus' last word to this man is this. No, you don't deserve death even though you are going to die. Nobody deserves this kind of death. But rather, you get paradise. Jesus, to his dying breath, uses his power to save others. To reconcile all things, and I do mean all things. And so if Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are really a way to reconcile all things back toward God, to restore a lost paradise reflected in the Garden of Eden, shouldn't this also be the work of the church? Shouldn't reconciliation of all things be our ministry? In fact, Paul says it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If Jesus used his power to reconcile all things back to God, then his disciples, which hopefully you and I are, then his disciples, if we want to say that Jesus is our Lord, his disciples also ought to use power to do the exact same thing as Jesus Christ did. Now, we aren't very God of very God. We are not going to be sacrificed on behalf of the entire world. We can't finally do the kind of reconciling that God does through Jesus Christ on that cross ourselves. But we certainly can be agents of that reconciliation. 
We can be agents of grace. We can be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. And by God, that's what we're called to be as a church. We can certainly live our lives in a way that exercises power, not for ourselves, but for others. We can certainly empty ourselves of selfish ambition in seeking the power that the world seeks and instead seek the power of Jesus Christ, the power that he sought, the power to extend God's grace to those who needed it the most in their lives. This text is especially challenging to us if we want to be the ones who control who gets God's grace. If we want to be the ones who control who receives salvation, it's challenging to us. If we want salvation to be for only the pretty, only the smart, only the nice, only the straight A student, only the hard workers, only the law abiding citizens, but God's grace is dangerous precisely because it breaks our assumptions and our quest for control of who receives salvation. Prostitutes, eunuchs, adulterers, prodigals, sinners, the diseased, the, the disabled, Pharisees, tax collectors, all the ones who are those people, the those people of our day, if you remember the sermon from our, from our revival. The those people, the folks who we've been called those people. All the ones who folks like us might look at and say, oh, thank God they're not in our church. Jesus deems every one of them worthy of grace and reconciles all of them, not just with God, but with the community that surrounds them. the society that deems them unworthy in the first place. All things means all things. Salvation isn't just spiritual. All the things that need to be reconciled, even and especially our relationships. Jesus came to do just that, to reconcile and make new. I don't know if I've told you about Kelly Gibson Daner before. I think I did it hate Phil. But if you've heard this already, take me aside after the service and say, Chris, you used this illustration already. <laughs> so apologies, apologies in advance. But this illustration is a powerful one. And one that I experienced through the eyes of people I really admire. Kelly's story, this is Kelly Gibson Daner. Uh, she's the one in the, the cap and gown. Uh, her story is a, is a great reminder of what it means to be reconciled, and it changed the way that I think about the death penalty forever, and those especially who are on death row. Some of the folks I think he would be most prone to say, and maybe most incorrect to say as well, are beyond the reach of God's grace. Kelly was such a person. She was convicted for the arranged murder of her husband. She was on death row and, and enrolled in a theology course for women uh, in prison that one of my professors at, at Candler taught, Jenny McBride, that's her in the top on the right. She was teaching as a chaplain. Jenny is brilliant. She's one of my favorite teachers and she is now an Episcopal priest here in Atlanta. Kelly wrote a good paper about uh, a, a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who you might have heard of, uh, uh, one of the foremost theologians of the 1900s. And she shared, uh, uh, Kelly uh, wrote it for Jenny, and Jenny shared this with a man on the left who is Jürgen Moltmann, who is one of the foremost theologians now. He's called the theologian of hope. I want to be called that one day. <laughs> Maybe the pastor of hope, I don't know. Shared it with Jürgen Moltmann, and Moltmann 
was like, wow, this is a great paper. And so Kelly was like, well, do you want to start a correspondence while I'm here in prison? And so they did. And Jenny's lectured on their correspondence and has written on it. There's a whole book on with their letters that go back and forth. But the point is, I believe that, thoroughly believe that Kelly had a conversion experience while she was in prison. That she came to know the grace of Jesus Christ while she was on death row. Sometimes I wonder how much of an influence that she might have had if the state had not executed her in 2015. I wonder how many thieves on the cross she could have introduced to the grace of God through Jesus Christ. I wonder how many lives she could have touched for those who were going to reintegrate into society. She died seeing amazing grace. Jesus lived and died so that people like you and me and like Kelly could be reconciled. He lived and died so that people under the bridge, when I drive in on the mornings, might be reconciled. He lived and died so that people we think might be outside of God's grace might be reconciled, that might have their own encounter with God's grace, and they can touch it, and it can be a real thing for them. That's why Jesus died. And he lived and died and was resurrected so that we could understand what real power means. A power that has severe consequences for how we use our own power. A power that might get us killed because the world doesn't recognize that power. The power of grace and love. And the great thing about God's power is that God alone wields it. I don't control it. You don't control it. No one gets to say who receives God's grace except God alone. And that is what makes it so amazing because I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. How could we respond with anything other than thanksgiving to such a God who reaches down into the depths and brings us up out of it? How could I'm going to light this paper on fire. Come Holy Spirit. Light us on fire. How could we respond with anything else other than thanksgiving? And that, my friends, is a power worth hailing. Crown him Lord of all. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is on page 694. Come, ye thankful people, come. We'll sing the first and last. Page 694, please stand. Receive this benediction, y'all. 
as you go to your Thanksgiving tables this week and have sometimes fun conversations, sometimes hard conversations. If your family's anything like mine, it's, um, it's, a, it's a, a interesting. <laughs> it can be an interesting conversation at Thanksgiving. Go with open ears, listen to each other, and show people the kind of power that you have learned about through Jesus Christ, the power of humble, loving service on behalf of others, no matter who they are. In the name of Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and serve. Amen. Amen.